I want to start by saying um, that I am so grateful. If you are a medical professional, if you're a nurse, if you're a doctor, um, if you are in any way connected to the medical world, um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you're doing and the sacrifice that you're making, the long hours that you're putting in, the way that you love so well and serve so well. If I was standing in front of you, I would give you a huge hug if I could. And if, uh, if we were together, I would probably have the whole church stand and give you a round of applause. And so, um, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much for what you do. <clears throat> Today we're going to start a brand new series called Hope Will Rise. Hope Will Rise. And uh, for the entire month of April, we are going to be looking at this word, hope. Philosophers have argued, they have argued for generations this question of what is hope. Um, I I was just listening to a podcast this week, and there were four different people that were um, quoting different philosophers throughout the history of humankind, and what their thoughts are were, that what their thoughts were on hope. Some said that hope was a virtue. Some said hope was a practice that we live out on a daily basis. Some say it's a promise. Some say it's a theological truth that we believe and that we ascend to. Some say it's something that we earn over time. We're, here's where we're going to land over the next four weeks. Over the next four weeks, we're going to land on this, that hope is a promise. Hope is a promise. A promise is something that we are confident in because the one who promised is trustworthy. So let me say that again. A promise is something we are confident in because the one who promised is trustworthy. Let me give you an example of this. My, my son is, uh, is great at this. If I tell him that we are going to go outside and we're going to play catch or we're going to go out and we're going to go for a walk or we're going to go do something, he holds me to what I say. Why does he do that? Because he trusts me. Because he has believed that I am trustworthy. So when I say something... And he hears me say that something, he's like, that's going to happen. That's a promise. That's a guarantee. And the reason he does that is because he sees his daddy as trustworthy. We are confident in the promise of hope because God, who promised us there is hope, is trustworthy. Let me say that again. We are confident in the promise of hope because God, who promised us there is hope, is trustworthy. God is trustworthy. Romans chapter 5, or Romans chapter 12, verse 12 says this, rejoice in our confident hope. We, We can rejoice. We can throw a party. We can be glad. We can be cheerful. We can be happy because we have confidence in our hope. We are confident in the promise of hope. Hope is the promise that there is still more to come. The sun is going to rise tomorrow. There will be another, another opportunity to take a crack at this thing. There is more to come. God is still at work. God is still at work. So during this series, I'm going to flip back and forth between using the word hope and using the phrase, there is still more to come. Now, to really understand this definition of hope that there's still more to come, we have to go back to the Israelite people, the, the people of God. And there's no better place to see this at play than their prayer book, which was the Psalms. And, uh, and so I, I just want to give you a heads up. This summer, we're going to be preaching all the way through the Psalms. But this morning, I'm just going to give you kind of a, a, a taste of it. Here we go. Let me show you some places where hope shows up. Hope begins to rise in the book of Psalms. Psalm 31 verse 24 says, Be strong and courageous, all you who put your hope in the Lord. Psalm 33, 20 and 22 say, we put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord. Our hope is in you alone. Psalm 37, verse 34 says, put your hope in the Lord. Psalm 39, 7 says, my only hope is in you. Psalm 42, 5 says, I will put my hope in God. Psalm 62 verse 5 says, let all that I am wait patiently before God, for my hope is in him. Psalm 65 5 says, you faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds, O God our Savior. You are the hope of everyone on earth, even those who sail on distant seas. Psalm 94 19, when doubts filled my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. 
Psalm 130, verse 7 says, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for the Lord there, for, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. Come on now. His redemption overflows. Psalm 146, verse 5. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord, their God. Over and over and over and over again, the psalmist reiterate that their hope is in the Lord. There is more to come because of the Lord. Now, this flows from deep within their bones, deep within their tradition. It was passed down to them from generation to generation to generation. Listen to this psalm. Psalm 71.5 says, O Lord, you alone are my hope. I've trusted you, O Lord, from my childhood. You see, it's been passed on from generation to generation. They, they would have told stories over and over and over again about being rescued, delivered from Egypt, from Pharaoh. When they came out from slavery and they faced the Red Sea and God split the Red Sea and they walked through on the dry land, they would have been taught there is more to come on the other side of the Red Sea over and over and over again. Now, for the Hebrew people, God's people, hope came down to two things. Two things. The first was God's character. And the second was this, that God was going to restore all things. That was often referred to as God's judgment or his justice. We'll get to that here in a second, okay? So let's start with God's character. Psalm 25 verse 5 says, lead me by your truth and teach me for you are. Just go ahead and say that out loud. You are. All right? For you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. You are. That is a statement about who God is. God's character is who God is. It's what makes God God. It's what God is like. For Israel, God's character was seen first and foremost in the creation story. So when they thought back to the, the creation narrative, they could see God's character woven inside of that narrative. And here's what they believed. They believed that a good God created a world to reflect his image, and this good God called his creation good. Good. So he created on the first day and said, it is good. Day two, it is good. Day three, it is good. Day four, it is good. Day five, it is good. Day six, it is good. Day seven, rest. All right? So it is good. A good God cannot create anything that is not good. So for Israel, God was good, and his goodness could be seen throughout all of his creation. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, my family, we went for a walk in the woods uh, behind our house. There's about 96 acres. And we went for a walk, and we were hunting these things called um, uh, mushrooms. Um, they're, they're these, we, we do it in the Midwest easy, all right, not those kind of mushrooms, but, but um, these mushrooms in the Midwest that you can actually fry up and eat. And we found them here in North Carolina, and my parents found um, a patch of them in the woods behind our house. I, I could tell you more later, but that's not the point. So we're walking through the woods, God's creation, and I'm looking around, paying attention, and I can see new life coming up out of the ground, new flowers, new trees, new vines being, being grown out of the ground. And I had this moment where I was like, this is evidence of God's character, this is the image of God's character. God's character is on full display in his creation. But God isn't only good. If you remember back in the fall, we did a series about the five G's of God's character. Let me walk us through them. All five of them can be seen in the creation narrative. So God is not only good, but in the creation story, we also see that God is gracious. God is present with his creation. He is in the creation. He is walking with Adam and Eve. See, this is what separates God, Yahweh, from all other gods. This God comes down to walk with his people. He walks among them. 
not because of what they have done. They haven't earned his presence, but because of who he is. He is gracious. He is with them. The list goes on. God is good. God is gracious. And God is generous. He is a giving God. He has always been a giving God. He has been giving from the beginning. He is not a taking God. He's not like the Greek gods where the humans must give in order to receive. This God, the God of Israel, Yahweh, this God gives first. He gives them exactly what they needed for today. It doesn't stop there. God is good, God is gracious, God is generous, and God is great. He holds all things together. He sustains all things. He knows all things. He is over all things. He is in all things. He is powerful enough, great enough to speak one word and creation came into existence. He is that great. And you guessed it, that's not it. God is good, God is gracious, God is generous, God is great, and God is glorious. We see his glory on full display when he speaks the first word and light pierces the darkness. That is his glory. That is new life exploding on the scene. That is light shining into the chaos. His everlasting, never-ending, always and forever presence is woven into the very fabric of his creation. And what's his crowning achievement? Human beings, which were the mirror that would reflect his glory, that would reflect his very image to the entire world. See, God's characteristics, they cannot be separated from one another. He couldn't be glorious and not good, gracious, generous, and great. So because he is all of these things, he gave his glory away for free to the very being that he created out of the dust. Let me say that one more time. He gave his glory away for free, that's graciousness, to the very being that he created out of of the dust. In the creation story, we see that God is good. God is gracious. God is generous. God is great, and God is glorious. Israel's hope was in the Lord. It was in the Lord's character. The foundation of their hope was God's character, who God was. And our hope, my friends, during unstable times, every day that we have breath in our lungs, our hope is in the Lord in the Lord's character, the Lord that is good, the Lord that is gracious, the Lord that is generous, the Lord that is great, and the Lord that is glorious. And then Israel's hope was in God's desire, his ability, and his mission to restore all things. God's justice or his judgment is the way that the Old Testament referred to it. Justice and judgment isn't what you just immediately thought of, okay? It's not about fire. It's not about hell. It's not even about a place called heaven. It's not even about the end times. It's not about the guy that stands on the corner with the big sign that says turn or burn. That is not what justice and and judgment are about. For Israel, God's justice and judgment was about God restoring all things back to the way that God created it to be. Let me say that one more time. For Israel, God's justice and judgment was about God restoring things back to the way that God created it to be. He was going to put it back together again. He was going to make it right again. There was going to be a Messiah or a Savior that would come and make it right again. That's what the prophecies of the Old Testament tell. This Messiah, this Savior, they believed that he was actually going to come and overthrow Israel's enemies. Israel thought this Messiah, this Savior, would be a king like Pharaoh, only better. All right? Better than the last one. A king that was for them and not against them, on their side and against the other guy. That's what they thought. This king would come and he would be for them but against their enemies. 
We see this all throughout the Psalms. One Psalm says, vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. Rescue me from deceitful and wicked men. Essentially, what the psalmist are writing is, when are you going to overthrow my enemies? When will you destroy my enemies? When will you come to destroy them over there? Right? When are you going to come and destroy the other guy? Fast forward. A guy named Jesus shows up on the scene. And he starts saying things like, I'm the son of man. I'm the son of God. And people, Israel, they start connecting the dots. And they started thinking, finally, God's going to do it. He's going to overthrow our enemies. He's going to defeat the Roman Empire. He's going to wipe out Caesar. No more pharaohs. This is it. Now, if you fast forward through the life of Jesus... You come to the Sunday before he is crucified, and you see Jesus coming into Jerusalem. We call it Palm Sunday, which is today. Some people call it the triumphal entry. Jesus comes riding into town on a donkey. Now, this would have been really odd for the audience because they would have expected him to come in on a powerful horse, a sign of power. A horse was the transportation of a king. I mean, think about it. When you travel around the world and you see a statue of a powerful man, usually they're riding a horse, right? Not a donkey. You you don't ever see the powerful guy riding in on a donkey on the statue. But the crowd on Palm Sunday goes along with it. They probably scratch their head a little bit. They go along with it, and then they start singing this song. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. There it is. They were ready to crown him king. This is what they've been looking for. This was the judgment that they had hoped for. They thought he was going to come and wage war against the Roman Empire and start a new kingdom. A new kingdom would be inaugurated. Can you feel the energy? Can you feel the anticipation? Can you feel the expectation? Can you feel the hope? God is going to do what we expect him to do. And then the story takes a hard turn. (laughs) Because Jesus becomes a servant. See, we find him. We find him taking off his outer garment and not as a powerful king ruling over with an iron fist, but washing his disciples' feet. I mean, that was the sign of a donkey after all. A donkey was a servant's animal. And then Jesus was arrested, and he doesn't put up a fight. In fact, he tells Peter to put his sword away because the sword isn't the weapon of choice in Jesus' kingdom. And then they watch their presumed king die on a cross. Can you imagine how hopeless they felt? All of that energy, all of that anticipation, Hosanna, the king has arrived, and now he's gone. Can you imagine how distraught they felt? I mean, sure you can, right? You've been there. You expected God to do something, and then he didn't. You had the plot all written out. You submitted it to God, and you heard God agree to your plan, and then there was a plot twist. You've been there. I've been there. It is disappointing God's plan is always better. God's plan is always better. See, God's judgment and his justice was never about war. It wasn't about fire. It wasn't about destroying a nation. It wasn't about eliminating other human beings. That's not where hope is found. 
Influence, maybe. Power, maybe. Position, maybe. Control, maybe. But not hope. When Jesus died on that cross, he was saying something with his life that he had already been saying to his disciples. He said things like, in order to live, you must die. You must take up your cross. You must become the last. You must become a servant. You, you must give yourself away. That is where hope is found. Plot twist. You can't have hope until you've given yourself up. This is what judgment or justice looks like in Jesus' kingdom. This is the restored world, mutual submission to one another, a place where we give ourselves away for the love of God and the love of our neighbor. Hope is found in dying to self and not elevating self. Paul says it like this in Romans 5. We know that suffering produces perseverance, per perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. He demonstrates his restoration plan for us. He demonstrates his justice and his judgment in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Suffering produces hope. Suffering produces hope. Listen to this poem by Caitlin Shetler. She says, you hand me a branch from the fig tree you withered, and we sit in silence until you say hope does not come with hosannas, and peace does not come with procession, but with wailing and withering and a lot of waiting. I want to read that one more time. You hand me a branch from the fig tree you withered, and we sit in silence until you say hope does not come with hosannas, and peace does not come with procession, but with wailing and withering and a lot of waiting. Hope is found in the wailing, in the withering, the waiting, the disappointment, the loss, the turbulence the doubt in the unknown. Hope rises up from the bottom of the empty barrel. Suffering produces hope. We cannot have hope without the death of Jesus. Giving himself up for us. That's what restoration of all things looks like. The true justice, the true judgment, setting the world right. Jesus taking up his cross and giving his life for you and I. Israel's hope was in God's character and God's plan of restoration. This is where hope begins. Hope begins in who God is and what God is up to in our world. Our hope, our hope today is in God's character, who he is, and God's plan of restoration, what, is he, what he is up to in our world. My friends, there is still so much more to come. During this series, we're going to end our time of teaching with a corporate prayer. I'm going to read a line, and then you're going to repeat it with Katie after me. And this is just a great reminder of the truth of who God is and what God is up to in the world. So let's pray this prayer together. In an unsteady season, we are building our lives on the unshakable character of God. In an unsteady season, we are building our lives on the unshakable character of God. Because he is unbreakable, we can walk in confidence even in the midst of the unknown. Because he is unbreakable, we can walk in confidence even in the midst of the unknown. 
We do not stand on the problems of life or on the pain of life. They will not have the final word. We do not stand on the problems of life or pain in life. They will not have the final word. We stand on the presence of God who will have the final word, a word of restoration. We stand on the presence of God who will have the final word, a word of restoration. We are hopeful people, trusting that God is still at work and there is still more to come. We are hopeful people, trusting that God is still at work and there is still more to come. Amen and amen.